Oh my god. What? Why are you- No. You're supposed to be my good plan. Okay, not that the rest of y'all are bad. Okay, I'm- This is- I'm- I'm hurting everybody's feelings right now, and they're hurting my feelings. Like, what is- This is not a good way to start this video. <laughs> Hey, what's up? Hello, it's Katie Coulson here. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to talk about the best books according to booktubers that they read in 2022. Now, I say read in 2022 because while a vast majority of the books mentioned in this video are going to be released in 2022, not all of them are. But in my opinion, that makes the ones that weren't even more exciting. Now, obviously, the statistics and getting book recommendations for things that the community really loves is a part of this video, but in my my opinion, showcasing other sides of booktube is the main point of this video. If there's anybody that you see that you love their taste or you think they sound intelligent, they're eloquent, they're funny, and you want to follow them, every single person is going to be linked down below. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you a compilation of each of the booktubers that put this specific book on their favorites, giving you a summary of what the book is about and then what each of them loved about it enough to put it on their favorite books of the year and them kind of selling it to you on why they think Think you should read it. And then after that, I'm going to pop in and say whether or not I'm surprised that the book is on the list, whether or not I'm surprised at where it ranks on the list, and whether I've read it, and if I have, what star rating I personally gave it. Now that is the first statistic that I want to talk about, and that's how much time I put into this, because it's astonishing. So I've been working on this for like a little over four weeks. And what I do is I use Pomodoro. I tracked every time I did a sprint and that's with constant editing. I wasn't getting up to go to the bathroom. I wasn't meandering. During those 25 minutes when I would mark it down, I was only editing. I did 62 sprints of 25 minutes a piece, which equaled 1,610 minutes, which is 26.83 hours, which is roughly 27 hours of editing for one video. Like, I clearly don't have a life, but hopefully you enjoy this video. I have watched over 300 of these best books of 2022 videos. Now this video is going to compile everything that was mentioned four or more times, but the four mentions are going to be honorable mentions and any book that is mentioned five or more times is going to be the bulk of this video. For the ones that were mentioned four times, we have Jade Legacy by Fonda Lee, Finley Donovan by El Casameno, Notes on an Execution by Dania Kakafka, We Spread by Ian Reed, Pin Pal by Dathan Arbach, The Push by Ashley Audrain, The Very Secret Society for Irregular Witches by Sango Mandana, The Roughest Draft by Emily Wibberly, The Dead Romantics by Ashley Poston, Know My Name by Chanel Miller, The Maid by Nita Prose, Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby, Tender is the Flesh by Augustina Bastarica, The Appeal by Janice Hallett, Alone with You in the Ether by Olivia Blake, Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton, My Best Friend's Exorcism by Grady Hendrix, The Martian by Andy Ware, Things We Never Got Over by Lucy Score, Heartless, uh, The Second in the Chestnut Springs series by Elsie Silver, Love and Other Words by Christina Lauren, Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid, The Saga series by Brian K. Vaughn, and Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. Okay, honorable mentions out of the way, we have 26 books that were mentioned five or more times in between 91 different videos, which is insane to me. But we're going to start at the lowest mentioned and work our way up to the top. So, we're going to start with number 26, which drum roll is all roads lead here. All roads lead here. All roads lead here. All roads lead here. All roads lead here by Mariana Zapata. I finally found a new favorite from Mariana Zapata, which is so exciting. The story follows this girl named Aurora. Aurora's life has just totally been turned upside down and she is just going through it. This book also deals with grief because she loses her mother. That's one of the reasons why she moves to the small town to kind of like find herself and to deal with her life and her grief. She ends up renting this apartment in someone's garage but when she gets there she finds out that the owner of this garage did not actually rent the place out to her. His son did and the father is not that happy about it. But the dad, Rhodes, does agree to let Aurora stay there for a little while until she finds someone else to live. It already sets up this kind of almost enemies 
to friends to more situation. Grumpy Sunshine, small town romance, hate everyone but you. It's also age gap. I'm pretty sure they don't kiss until like 50 pages from the end or something like that. It just made every other moment so much more fun because like the tension is just so high. I think about it all the time. The man in this book, Tobias Rhodes, is the ultimate book husband. Like, you cannot tell me that there is a better man out there. I'm like, it's flawless. It's perfect. I love it so much. It's become like a comfort audiobook listen for me. This one was mentioned five times, and I am not surprised, but I'm a little surprised because this book is really long, and I am halfway through it, and I've been halfway through it for a month, and cannot get myself to finish it because I personally don't really care for it. I mean, I don't think it's bad, but it's just a little too long. And like everything that they're saying, I agree with. I think I'm just not the reader for it. So maybe I should probably just DNF it. But anyway, let's move to number 25. House of Sky and Breath. 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 House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J. Mass. I am Sarah J. Mass trash. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm one of those girlies. They are like popcorn candy to me, even though they're huge. This is the second book, so I'm not going to talk about the plot of this one. It's like Criminal Minds meets Akatar because it has like this murder mystery plot to it, and it is so good. And then we have the ending, which is still like the most shocking, amazing, crazy ending that I have ever read in a book in my entire life. I'm not exaggerating when I say I screamed, cried, and threw up after I finished this. This one is so funny to me because I honestly thought that House of Sky and Breath was going to be way higher up on the list. It's Sarah J Moss. Like, the girlies are obsessed with Sarah J Moss. I myself have in the past been obsessed with Sarah J Moss, so I'm very surprised. But after I heard about what happened in the ending, I thought people were just going to give it five stars because of the last line of the book, which is insane. But anyway, that really, really surprised me personally. So let's move on to book 24. Our Wives Under the Sea. Our Wives Under the Sea. Wives Under the Sea. Our Wives Under the Sea. Our Wives Under the Sea by Julia Armfield. In it, we're following two wives. One of them is a like deep sea explorer biologist, and she goes in submarines for weeks at a time to do these expeditions. She's supposed to be down there for a few weeks, and things go wrong, and she is trapped down there with a small crew of people for six months. And then the other POV is her wife, who is now helping her through her recovery. And that rehabilitation process back on dry land is so complicated and nuanced because of course she's doing it out of love but the person who she loves she doesn't really even recognize anymore. It was heartbreaking it talks a lot about grief and what it's like to lose someone that you love to fall out of love what happens when people in a relationship change. I could cry because it was so emotional and stunning. It really had me thinking it really had me reevaluating the concept of grief. I really loved both of the women. Like, I think that both of them were very strong in very different ways. I have not stopped thinking about this book since I read it. This probably wins the award for the loveliest writing I read this year. I just wanted to extract it all, blend it up, fill up a tub with it, and then just bathe in it. It was so wonderful. It is for sure one of my favorite books ever now. Easy five out of five. This is one that I'm so happy ended up making it onto this list because I want to read this so bad. So this is like giving me every excuse to read this and I've heard it's really short and honestly like I love the booktubers that talked about this book and the way they described it was so intriguing. So this is definitely getting added to my TBR like immediately. One True Loves, One True Loves, One True Loves, One True Loves, One True Loves by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Because it is called One True Loves, you might be thinking, what does that mean? There's multiple loves? Yes, indeed, there are. Basically, Emma was in love with her high school sweetheart. They were like so obsessed with each other, so in love. But then a couple years later, he disappears in a helicopter accident. So obviously she grieves and moves on with her life and eventually falls in love again. And everything finally seems to be going right in the world until she gets a call at dinner one night from Jesse. Hey, I actually wasn't dead. They found me. I've been like stuck on this remote island for the past three years. I'm coming home to you. And of course, Emma is left with a decision to make. Does she want to continue to pursue this relationship with her friend? Or does she want to do the right thing and go and live with her husband? And I will just never stop screaming from the rooftops about it. It was just such an experience. I can't overstate enough how much I feel like everybody would benefit from reading this book. This is going on my list of like universally recommended books. Do not be surprised to see Taylor Jenkins read on this list because five of her books got in the top 91. Of all of the books that I vetted, five 
of her books were in the top 91. That's insane. And also, this book came out in 2016. 2016? This book came out six years ago, and this many people said it was their best book of the year? Like, Taylor Jenkins Reid cannot miss. Like, she is a national success story, and I feel like now I have to read this book. Like, I feel like I'm morally obligated as a Taylor Jenkins Reid fan to read this book. Confessions. 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 Confessions by Kane Minato, translated by Stephen Snyder. This is a psychological revenge story. This is about Yuki Moraguchi, and she is a middle school teacher and a single mother. And a few months before, she had a daughter who died on the school premises, and she tells the kids of this classroom, I know two of you murdered her, and I'm gonna slowly reveal who did it kind of thing. And starting to unfold a maniacal plot for revenge. Each section ends with a twist, a reveal that is so fun. Literally every time a chapter in this ends, it's like the biggest plot twist I've ever seen in my freaking life. It is crazy. Oh, I'm still reeling after the end of chapter one. I really am. I think this was one of the most unique thrillers that I read this year or like ever. I don't know what Kane Monado is on, but she needs to share it with the class because American authors, they do not do it like this. I am so proud of this book for being number 22 because it deserves it and you would have already seen I put it on my top uh, books of 2022. So obviously I think it's a stunner. It's five stars and I think that this is like solely based on Kayla from Books and Lala. Like she got so many people in the community to read this book because she picked it as one of her literally dead book club picks where Gavin and I were both on the live show with her and all three of us put us in our best books of 2022. So I think that this deserves so much more hype. And this book also came out in 2014. 2014? Like that's, I think that, yes, 2014 is the longest ago backdated release on this list. That's a long time ago. That's eight years. And we're putting it on our best books of 2022. Astonishing. Now, speaking of a favorite book of mine and being proud that it's on the list, let's move on to book 21. The Last House on Needless Street. 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 The Casa al final de Needless Street de Cation Award. We're following a couple POVs. We're following a man who drinks in front of his TV and has gaps in his memory. A little girl who's not allowed to go outside, not after last time. <laughs> And then another point of view is a cat who loves to read the Bible. The neighbor who comes in next door and moves in is there because she suspects Ted killed her sister. He's used to living like where no, there's no neighbors or anything. And because of this um, situation upsetting his routine, Ted's life begins to like spin out of control. The plot twists in this book, if you don't guess it before it happens, are will truly rock your world. <laughs> This is by far one of the weirdest books I have ever read. I'm still not completely over how much this book took over my mental space. <laughs> Trina Ward is such a mastermind and a genius behind the way she tells stories. It's just one of my favorite books. I think I will probably reread this around every fall, the beginning of fall, just to get in that like October Halloween type of mood. A best book of mine of 2022 makes it on the list yet again. And I am like so proud of this book also for getting on this list because it deserves the hype. And it's a book that I had to read twice before I understood understood how good it was and I'm so happy because I thought that a lot of people were going to put it on their worst of the year because it is a very complex and um complicated and weird book so I'm astonished that so many people put it on their favorites but I do think that it is well deserved and I'm so happy that it made it into this video a dowry of blood 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 by S.T. Gibson it's written as if Constanta Dracula's first bride is writing a letter to Dracula and also seeing Dracula kind of bed other women and this kind of poly relationship dynamic going on and it also focuses on an abusive relationship both mentally and physically and what it's like to feel like you don't have control and what it's like to love someone but to know that they're not good for you or that they're not necessarily a good person. It's a tale about obsession, about desire, 
about control, manipulation, abuse, love, all of those different things mixed together. I was blown away by the writing. It is very lyrical. I thought the writing was absolutely stunning. I just loved it. This book is gorgeous. I think this book is a work of art. I think that it is one of the most beautiful, haunting, and painful stories that I have ever read. Oh, it was just a masterpiece. This is a masterpiece. Wow, we are having stunner after stunner after stunner. A Dowry of Blood was not only my best book of 2021, but is arguably my favorite book of all time. But I'm obsessed with this book. And if you haven't read it yet, it's short, it's lyrical, it's stunning, it's about vampires, like polyamory. It's literally stunning. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. 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 And tomorrow and tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. Mainly we follow the friendship between this boy and girl who met in the hospital. One of them is in hospital visiting their sister and one of them has been in a car crash. And they bonded over their love of video games. One of the nurses is like, hey, that's the first time that that boy has spoken in like months. He was in a traumatic car accident. They were like, can you keep coming back and hanging out? And in that time, they become game designers. And they create their first video game together. They become famous together. It's also a, a really meaningful uh, depiction of friendship over a long period of time. Sam and Sadie, their friendship over like 30 years, chef's kiss so if you are a fan of 90s onwards games and the development of that kind of technology and that journey as well as the journey of their friendship this is definitely right up your street it's the best book i've ever read best book i've ever read hands down i adored this the pen game is unrivaled at the very least you are in for a a literary treat that was another book that i had the physical of but i immediately handed it off to somebody else because i was like please god everyone read this if i could give everyone a copy i would i'm not gonna lie i really thought that tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow was gonna be higher up on the list because i feel like there was like a good month there where i saw this book everywhere but that being said uh the clips that you just saw these people have such amazing things to say about this book like they are saying it's like one of the best written one of the best books hands down they've ever read in their life i feel like we all have to read it now in the dream house 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 by carmen maria machado it's carmen's experience in an abusive toxic relationship with another woman and the ways in which she almost placated it almost she 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 craved this abusive relationship even though she knew it wasn't right she felt like she needed it she felt like it was all that she had and i feel like when i think about domestic abuse i think about heterosexual couples which is kind of a bias that we have societally. The research that is made or lack thereof in terms of uh, exploring domestic abuse and toxic relationship in uh, queer couples. She creates a haunted house for you, but the haunted house is built with things like gaslighting and things like intimidation. We always talk about abuse and how anyone could be in an abusive situation. You're never too smart, you're never too cute, you're never too fun, you're never too witty to be in an abusive relationship. Like, it just could happen. I mean, the pros, liquid gold some of the most beautiful writing i've ever read in my life and holy shit this blew me away it's so cool this i can't recommend it enough i'm very happy for carmen maria machado for getting this spotlight and how many people are still continuing to say this was the best book of the year and i read this and i absolutely loved it i gave it four stars instead of five but that's because i'm not a huge short story fan and i don't really read that much nonfiction. but i am aware that this is a five star book it just didn't hit me as hard as it did for other people so this is definitely one that i would highly recommend project hail mary 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 by andy weir and you basically follow this guy who wakes up in outer space on a ship with two dead bodies and he has no memory of how he got there so first of all who is he Second of all, why is he alone? And third of all, why is he in outer space? And he slowly starts to uncover exactly where he is and how he's going to find his way back to Earth. He is in this room where there's like a computer that tests him and like the more knowledge he, can, the more right answers he gives, the more access he gets to the spaceship, which is really neat. And surviving this trip and then trying to figure out what his actual mission is, which is a Hail Mary to save Earth. It's so good. I cannot, I cannot praise this book more. This one, 
Like, I still think about it. I just love it. It makes me so happy. I don't know why I thought that Project Hail Mary came out like three years ago when it didn't. It came out in 2021. So I do own this book, but I haven't read it yet. But I am going to be very excited if maybe I do a follow up to this video when I've read quite a few of them to see if I end up agreeing with the ones that I need to read on whether or not I think they deserve to be on this list. Seven days in June. 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 Seven days in June by T. Williams. Follows our two main characters who had a passionate seven day love affair kind of when they were young. So they're both authors and they write very different fiction. Him in the literary space and her in the romance space. And she may have loosely inspired her hero on the man. They're both writers and they've been writing their books to each other but without either of them knowing. They end up seeing each other at this like author convention thing and they hadn't seen each other in such a long time. I, I think since they were like teenagers and they fell in love and then he broke her heart. So it's a second chance romance. But the love, ugh, the love just hits so hard in this book and you love all of the characters so much and you're rooting for them so hard and it was just so, so good. The weight that black women bear and the weight that black men bear, all of that, like there's so much baggage coming in with their relationship and I I like that it's not just brushed off. It's actually dealt with in a respectful and realistic and comforting yet heartbreaking and devastating way. A, a debatably perfect book. Absolutely stunning. Um, I could cry just thinking about it actually. This is black love in its purest form. So yeah, definitely a major, major favorite for the year and I definitely think you guys should be picking this one up. Another book I loved, Seven Days in June. I loved it. I thought it was absolutely great. I didn't give it a full five stars, but maybe that's just because I'm not a big romance reader or what, but I thought it was really good. And I definitely agree with everything that everybody is saying about this book. And the chronic pain representation was absolutely stunning. So this was really good. And I definitely agree with its placement in this list. Spy X Family. Spy Family. Spy Family. Spy Family. Spy Family. Spy Family by Tatsuya Endo. It is a adorable story about a spy. And his latest mission involves him having to infiltrate a private academy. Basically in like infiltrate a school system to try and get that like take down a bad guy. So he goes and finds this little girl Anya to be his daughter and he doesn't know that she can actually read minds. And he has to find a wife as well and he ends up coming across somebody who turns out to be an assassin. But he doesn't know that she's an assassin and she doesn't know that he's a spy but Anya knows that she's an assassin and that he's a spy so it's just like really funny. But they each have their secrets from each other they don't tell each other who they really are and it leads to some fantastically hilarious predicaments. It's just so much fun and so you unique and so cute. Do you just love to gatekeep yourself from joy? Because that's the only reason you wouldn't read this book. It's literally a ray of sunshine. I'm gonna freaking cry. I'm gonna freaking cry. I am so beyond happy that this is as high up on the list as it is because a lot of people in booktube are very afraid to talk about manga because the book community is vastly belittling of manga and say, oh, you're just too stupid to read real words or your attention span is too short. So we don't talk about it. And I love that we are broaching into that subject a lot more. But Spy Family, I'm telling you right now, like it's so freaking good. If you don't think you're going to like manga, you will love it. You will love it. It's so freaking good and it deserves all the hype and more, give this a shot because I'm like, I'm willing to guarantee that you will enjoy it. Carrie Soto is back. 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 Carrie Soto is back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Carrie Soto is basically the greatest tennis player that has ever lived. Kind of Venus and Serena. And how she broke pretty much every single record there is to break in tennis. She broke it. She has the most grand slams of anybody. She is just an absolute legend. When she retires at 30 something, she goes out on top. And now there's a new hot shot tennis player on the scene. And Carrie is in a position in her life where she is not really ready to admit defeat, despite the fact that her body is not able to keep up like it once was. So Carrie's like, no, 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 I did not bust my ass for this many years to get my freaking titles taken away by this young hotshot. It was fucking incredible. And it deserves the F-bomb because um, I, it was the greatest. It was the greatest. I love this book with my entire heart and soul. I loved it a ton. Like, oh. If I could one day do anything, write anything that makes anybody feel the way any of her books have made me feel, um, I will have known that I, I made it because she just, she's amazing. Now, the only reason that I'm surprised about this being as high up as it is, is because 
I adored Carrie Soto. I gave it five stars. I think it was amazing. It was so well written. I loved the characters. It was so freaking good. But I thought that if you didn't love tennis or if you didn't just love a character-based story, you were not going to like this. And especially you weren't going to put it on your best books of the year. So I was very surprised that this many people did, especially book readers who I follow who do not traditionally read this kind of story. This is another reason why Taylor Jenkins Reid literally can't miss. Slewfoot. 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 Slewfoot by Brahm. So this takes place in the 1600s in Connecticut around like the witch hysteria. Abba is like your regular, regular, everyday average kind of girl. She's married. She's just trying to fucking make her money, trying not to be like too scandalous, you know, trying not to show too much ankle. Otherwise, the men of the town will burn her as a witch and a slut. And then one day she discovers that on her land, there is this ancient magical tree and under the tree is this creature named Slewfoot who takes a liking to her and now wants to help her get revenge on the people who have wronged her. Is basically putting like magical steroids in her crops to make them grow faster but then the town is like she's a woman? She is a woman? How could she possibly possibly be making money? She's a woman. So they basically are like you're a witch and we're gonna burn you at the stake. This perfectly encompasses the phrase of I support women's rights and women's wrongs. This is like such an amazing revenge witchy horror book. I feel like it has like a pretty universal appeal. Unless you hate women or Satan, then maybe don't. If you if you don't like women or Satan, don't read the book. I don't, I don't think you would like it. But also if you don't like women or Satan, why are you here? That's suspicious. What are you doing here? Think I wouldn't notice? Mm, slow foot, slow foot by our baby Brom. This book, you would have already seen. I love it. I love it. I'm obsessed with one of my best books of 2022. I think it's absolutely stunning perfection. And I thought that it was so weird, like so dark and whimsical, like fairy tale, gothic, creepy, that I thought nobody else but Jordan Land and I were gonna like it. Like, I really thought everybody else was gonna put on like their worst books of the year. So to see it this high up on the list validates me so much. Every summer after. 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 Every summer after by Carly Fortune. It's past and present perspective about this couple that were best friends growing up and falling in love and being in this cute little young love relationship that is all leading up to this big fight. And the whole time that you're reading, it's basically like this big mystery that you don't know. Like you don't know what she did that was so bad that made them stop talking for so long. And at the end, when I found out what happened, I was like, uh, that is not what I expected at all. It kind of hurt my own feelings. And then the other alternating chapters are as they are adults reconnecting over this big grief, this death that happened around them that kind of brought them back together. But I am kind of cynical sometimes when I read romances, but this I was like, oh, so like I could fall in love. Like I'm not even kidding you right now when that's how real this book was for me. And oh my God, I loved it so much. I sobbed reading this book multiple times. This took me on an emotional roller coaster that I just like didn't want to get off of. One of the easiest decisions of my life to put this at number one for 2022. I thought I saw people put this on their worst books of the year. Maybe this is one of those times where it's going to end up in both sorts. Like it was a lot of people's worst books and it was a lot of people's best books. But this is a book that I don't know if would be for me. So I'm not sure if I would want to read it because I can pretty much guarantee you that I'm not going to be the reader for this, but if you think I would love it and you want to put it in the comments down below, let a girl know. Malibu Rising. Malibu Rising. Malibu Rising. Malibu Rising. Malibu Rising. Malibu Rising. Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. We're following the Reva siblings. Specifically Nina. She's basically had to raise her siblings since she was like 13 years old. Honestly, maybe even younger. Like she literally was driving them to school when she was like 14. Mick Reva is a very famous singer. Their, their dad. Honestly, Mick Reva. I hate him. 
it follows the siblings on this night that they're throwing this huge party there's just so much drama also this whole book takes place in malibu during the 80s just imagine like hollywood celebrities sex drugs rock and roll that type of thing this book was so incredibly good and i honestly wish i could like erase my memory and read this book again for the very first time the vibes were immaculate i just thought it was done so well i just loved it i loved the sibling relationship there's just something about taylor jenkins reads writing that makes it so appealing i don't really know what it is her historical fiction novels i just can never put it down this book is heartbreaking it's sad it's beautiful you learn lessons throughout this book you laugh you cry it's like it's everything you want in a book and more another taylor jenkins read no one is surprised but what we are surprised by is that her 2021 release beat out over her 2022 release but only by an inch because honestly anything this woman comes out with i will get five stars it's a little less surprising because malibu rising is like directly connected to daisy jones and the six whereas carrie soto is very far left field where it's technically connected but you have to like the character or at least just love taylor jenkins reed to pick that one up where i feel like after daisy jones and the six and the seven husbands of ellen hugo people were just riding the high of taylor jenkins reed and picking up malibu rising and then when they read that one and it wasn't as in like the celebrity media as her other two books i think that maybe they wouldn't have picked up carrie soto so that makes sense as to why that one is a little bit farther down on the list but i adored this book i thought it was fantastic so i definitely recommend it and i agree with it being at this part of the list magnolia parks magnolia parks magnolia park magnolia park magnolia parks universe magnolia parks universe the magnolia parks universe by jessa hastings this is a contemporary romance following london socialite magnolia parks and her tumultuous relationship with her ex bj ballantyne who are basically like childhood friends to love is and it starts off where they're not together because bj cheated on magnolia they cannot stay out of each other's lives though they still heavily lean on each other but they hurt each other relentlessly it is basically Basically, Gossip Girl set in high society London and it's just this back and forth toxic romance and that's why I always say if you like Gossip Girl and like the whole Blair and Chuck vibe you would love Magnolia Parks. Gossip Girl. Gossip Girl vibes. Major Gossip Girl vibe and especially if your favorite characters are Chuck and Blair you will love Magnolia and BJ. Listen Jessa Hastings is a freaking artist and this series is her masterpiece. I love Jessa's writing first and foremost. That is like my favorite thing about this book. Jessa Hastings is an amazing writer. The writing just spoke to me on a cellular level, like spoke to my soul. I would pay any amount of money to crawl inside her brain and just live there for a while because I don't know how she came up with this. I annotated this book so much to death. I annotated the absolute crap out of this one. These are definitely like some of my most annotated books ever. I love everything about this book. It is such an amazing, amazing story. I've never read a series as incredible as this one. And this book literally means so much to me. I'm thankful that I found a new all-time favorite author and it reminds me why I love reading. It's just so special. The thing that is so impressive about this is that all seven of these booktubers were not talking about Daisy Hates. They were not talking about Magnolia Parks. They were not talking about a specific book in the series. All of them were talking about the entire series. Now, I should tell you that there were multiple people in this list that gave Daisy Hates specifically as the best book of the year. If I had included every single time a booktuber mentioned a book in this series, it would be well over seven people. But this is just the seven people that mentioned the series in its entirety, which I felt counted to go toward this list. And I actually felt that it counted so much, I have the book and I'm going to read it. I'm gonna read it, okay? Do I know if it's gonna be for me? No, it probably won't be, but y'all convinced me. Daisy Darker. Daisy Darker. Daisy Darker. Daisy Darker. Daisy Darker. Daisy Darker. Daisy Darker by Alice Feeney. It is a modern day retelling of Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None. We're following the Darker family and Daisy in particular. She's going to be going back to this island where her Nana lives. And when the low tide or tide, something like that goes out, you're kind of stuck there. The, the grandmother is basically having all of our family come for her 80th birthday. It's a very dysfunctional family. And then, what do you know? Nana dies. 
and they're like, what the fuck? People start getting picked off one by one. It's a very locked room. And you're trying to figure out who could be responsible for this. Like who is killing this family? But the atmosphere. Oh my God. The atmosphere. With like the stormy island October vibes, like just really did it for me. Like I was obsessed with this. It has a twist that will make you want to reread the entire book immediately. Guess what I did. I read this book twice and I really want to read it again because it is so good. I was obsessed with the characters. Like none of these characters are good people. They're all very shitty people, but it was just so entertaining to read. I thought her metaphor and her simile was just beautiful in here. This was a fantastic book. I gave it five stars too. Yes. Overall, I just thought it was a great, fun mystery with a perfect atmosphere, beautiful writing, and absolutely worth the read if you haven't gotten to it yet. Number nine is an Alice Feeney? Just slap me in the face. I am so shocked by that because I don't think that Alice Feeney, while a widely known author, I don't believe that she is a widely high rated author. Like this book, Daisy Darker, I will tell you, I gave it four stars. I loved it and I could possibly reread it and give it a four and a half star. I am planning on rereading it in the future. I really enjoyed it. I've definitely seen quite a few people put it as their worst book of 2022. So go into it with a grain of salt. Not everybody's gonna love it, but I have never liked any of Alice Feeney's books. I have given all of her books one or two stars and then read this one and was blown away, like completely surprised that this was the same woman. So I agree. I think it's a great book. Do I think it should be the ninth highest in this video? No, but I think it's really good and I would definitely recommend it to people. The Last Housewife. 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 The Last Housewife by Ashley Winstead. said. We were following a woman named Shay who, when she was in college, her and two of her friends get involved in something they weren't really expecting. Met this man who is seductive and a talker and really brought her under his wing and a few of her other friends. And they get lured into this sex cult. And then while they're in that cult, one of the friends commits suicide. Her and one of her friends end up making their way out of it. And she frames the story all around this little housewife listening to a true crime podcast when suddenly, she realizes that the story being told on the podcast is her own. And the host of that podcast is someone she's known since childhood. She finds out through that podcast that one of her best friends committed suicide. She has never believed that this was actually a suicide. So she reaches out to this podcaster and they kind of team up to figure out what's going on, figure out what's going on right now, but also what was going on 10 years earlier. She is convinced now that both of the friends were actually murdered by somebody in the cult. You're basically following Shay's journey as she goes undercover in a sex cult, trying to get to the bottom of what happened to her friend. There is a heavy, heavy, heavy trigger warning that I need you to check up if you think you need to. This book deals with themes of suicide, sexual assault, misogyny, abuse. There's a lot of violence against women, both physically and sexually, and there's even like emotional and mental abuse. It just like calls out every little thing that men do that puts women on edge. And of course it has feminine energy, feminine rage, good for her vibes. This is definitely like in my top five favorite thrillers ever. Maybe in my like top three. Yeah, this is in my top three favorite thrillers ever. Okay, Ashley Winstead. Okay, Ashley Winstead, listen, I DNF'd this book in 2022, but I didn't get very far into it. I was skeeved out by the violence against women, but then based on hearing all of these people talk about the book, they really intrigued me and how I was probably very mistaken on the way I was intaking the violence against women and that it was not gratuitous. So I am definitely willing to give this another chance. I regret DNFing it now and I am probably gonna pick it up in 2023. How high we go in the dark. 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 How high we go in the dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu. This is like near future, I maybe 2050. This is a collection of short stories that all connect to one another. That all have this interweaving theme of a pandemic and the effects of a pandemic on the world. A little peek in at humanity and how people respond to tragedy and grief. And so we're seeing little vignettes from different people around the world and their experiences with the pandemic. The stories themselves range from things like putting human characteristics into a pig, um, following a euthanasia for children, um, a hotel full of dead bodies. This is a book 
book that's like never going to leave my mind ever. It was just so special. Um, I had such a great experience with it that I had to give it five out of five. One of the most beautiful books that I have ever read. It is just so devastating. But it's also one of the smartest pieces of science fiction you'll ever read. I don't think a lot of people read it. I know some people did. Um, I think more people should. Like, it deserves to get more more eyeballs on its pages than it's had. A sci-fi short story got to number seven on this list. You could never have made me believe that before I did the statistics for myself. One, sci-fi is not normally what would be this high on the list. Usually it would be romance or perhaps like a historical fiction, a fiction, maybe even a mystery, but a sci-fi? That speaks so highly to this book, especially because it's so short and apparently it's so weird and it's like about a pandemic. I am so intrigued. The people that talked about this book, the way they talked about it, I have got to read this. And honestly, this is giving me the motivation to go out tomorrow morning and buy it. And honestly, I just might. The Mindfuck series. 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 The Mindfuck series by S.T. Abbey. There's actually five books in one, but it's one giant book. Follows a girl who is a serial killer. She has a very, very dark and traumatic past. It's her story of getting revenge for something awful that happened to her. She hunts them down one by one and she tortures them. It's very good and she kills them. But it's not just all serial killer revenge. There's also a romance subplot where our main character is falling in love with the FBI agent who's assigned to her case. And he's trying to crack this serial killer case at the same time as he's falling in love with this woman. And it turns out the woman is a serial killer. This is a book about female lady rage, good for her, female serial killer, good stuff. I've never been so like enraptured in a series in my life. I couldn't stop. Like every time I got to the end of the chapter, it was a cliffhanger and I had to keep going. I was like, oh my God, is he gonna find out? What is gonna happen? Do I want him to find out? Do I want them to stay together? Am I like encouraging her? Like, I don't know how I feel. The ending of this series is one of my all time favorite endings in the history of ever. It was so fun. It was so entertaining, so over the top. The gore was amazing. The romance and smut was Okay, fun. It's so good. Like, honestly, forget all about the romance. The plot. It's the plot. The plot of this series is just so unbelievably good. But this series has personality, okay? It has flavor. It has anger and rage, and I was just fucking obsessed, okay? It's on Kindle Unlimited, and it is fantastic. I've talked about surprises, but this one takes the cake. This takes the cake. Okay, if I had not read it for myself, I would be like, y'all are wrong for this. What, what do you mean the mindfuck series? Like, what are you talking about? But when I tell you that I read this book physically, I read this book and I could not agree more. I could not agree more and I could not be more proud that this is this high on the list. And it's so sad that S.T. Abby, unfortunately, as you know, McKay said in this video, she did pass away, but she never got to see how popular her series would become so many years after it came out. Like this series came out in 2016. And now in 2022, this many people are putting the entire series, not just one of the books, the entire series on their best books of 2022. And it blew up all over TikTok. Like, that's amazing. And when I tell you, if you start reading it, listen, okay, if you start reading this book, the first two of them out of the five, I did not like. But three through five, stunning. Part of your world, 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 part of your world by Abby Jimenez. But this book is about Alexis and Daniel. Alexis is a doctor from the city. She is in the middle of a divorce from an emotionally abusive guy. And she didn't realize that she was experiencing emotional abuse until she went to therapy and really got to like work through her thoughts and feelings. And a guy who is a mayor, but also has a woodworking side business. And they don't fit into each other's worlds at all. And he's got a baby girl goat and this deaf dog. And they accidentally meet each other in the small town that this guy live in, lives in. They're just like immediately drawn to each other and can't seem to like separate themselves. It's like kind of a opposites attract situation. It really centers around kind of family legacy and doing what you want to do versus doing what you're expected to do. I love the way she writes these rom-coms. There were some moments where I laughed out loud. It just felt like a perfect 
fairy tale and I don't know I just I loved it so much. By the end of this book honestly I, I did tear up and I was also just shocked at how much I enjoyed it and how much I think this book is going to stick with me. I could just hug this book. The characters were great, the love story was great, and I think that like for a romance it still had a really solid plot to it as well. But this book is such a standout I really think you need to pick it up. You're telling me that a standalone contemporary is number five on this list. With this cover that just looks very generic, in my opinion, nothing bad about it, but very generic, I never thought that this would be this high up on the list. And what speaks to that is I actually owned this book because it was sent to me by Book of the Month, and I unhauled it because when I read the review, it sounded boring. So I unhauled it, and now I so regret that because everybody's saying it's amazing. And it's number five, number five most mentioned best book by booktubers in 2022. I'm gonna have to repurchase this book. Legends and Lattes. 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 Everyone's been talking about Legends and Lattes. Legends and Lattes. Legends and Lattes. Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. Is about an orc named Viv. And she is a mercenary who has now retired. And she decides to start a coffee shop in this big fantasy city because nobody in the city knows what coffee is and she wants to share that warmth and joy with everybody. And they're like, what are you gonna serve? Bean soup? Why would I want bean water in a cup? Of course there's intrigue and people trying to stop her and steal from her and all of that kind of stuff. So it has that fantasy element to it. This is the ultimate cozy fantasy. It is so cute and adorable. The descriptions of coffee and pastries in here are literally like mouth-watering. The details of the food description and the drinks just were absolutely enchanting. There is a little rat guy who is addicted to coffee, makes pastries, and can barely speak, and I will do anything for him. Anything. There is also a character in here named Thimble, and I'm not being dramatic when I say I would die for Thimble. I wish that I could read this book for the first time again, truly. It was phenomenal. I loved it. Maybe one of the most, like, the loveliest books I read this year of just like, this is just a delight. And it's like this lovely, heartwarming story that I just, oh, I loved it so much. Highly recommend. Highly, highly recommend this book. If you haven't read this one yet, I highly, highly recommend. Okay, um, I don't want to be a negative Nancy. And I don't want people to stop watching this video because you're gonna get so upset. I thought this book was okay. I just don't think that cozy books in general are for me. Um, I gave it three stars. I thought it was fine. And I did love the sapphicness of this book. But I personally wouldn't put it this high up on the list. But since everybody loves it so much, I would definitely highly recommend it because I am the only person that I know that did not give it five stars. So take my opinion with a tiny grain of salt. I'm glad my mom died. 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 I'm glad my mom died by Jeanette McCurdy. For those of you who are unfamiliar, Jeanette McCurdy was a child actress and she played Sam on iCarly and also on Sam and Cat. She speaks to us about the childhood that she never had and how her mother mentally and physically abused her is just absolutely appalling and the struggles that she had supporting her family growing up as a child actor. But then it also goes into alcoholism, toxic family environments, other abusive relationships, eating disorders, mental abuse, sexual abuse, and depression, anxiety, grooming, child abuse. I think like most people watching here, I really grew up with a Nickelodeon then Schneider phase. I was the generation where I iCarly was it. I would come home, I'd watch iCarly, Victorious, Hannah Montana, like that was my era, you know? I loved iCarly. It's absurd the way somebody can struggle so much and have such a difficult life behind closed doors because as a kid you would be like, oh my god, it must be amazing to be famous. But meanwhile, she's having this huge abusive relationship with her mother and it's awful, you know? It was so interesting to go back and hear about 
someone who I looked up to and was jealous of and was like, oh my God, this girl has a perfect life. Like she's blonde, she's skinny, she's a famous actress, she's rich. Like what could possibly be wrong with her? To go back and read what she was going through when I was a child thinking those thoughts just really puts a lot in perspective. I personally listened to this one on audiobook and listened to Jeanette narrate the story herself. There really are moments where Jeanette McCurdy like audibly tears up while reading the book, um, which makes you as the listener tear up as well. I think she's just incredibly brave for putting this out there with such honesty. Even months later after reading this book, I was still thinking about it. I think this is one that's going to be read for years and years and years. It was an instant classic. Definitely one of the best memoirs that I've read. Five out of five freaking stars. I would totally recommend this. I feel like everyone's recommended it, but I would totally recommend it. I would highly recommend you guys read this. If you haven't read it, I would, I would, I would recommend it. Mentioned 13 times is a non-fiction. A non-fiction about a celebrity. That's astonishing, but if you've read this book or even read the title, you would not be astonished at all. Now I will tell you, this would have gone at number two if I had included this in my best books of the year, which I was this close. Because I mentioned 12, it was book number 13. So I didn't end up making it onto my list and I should have included it because this would have made this book number two. And I love this book. It's five out of five stars. I've recommended it to so many people. It's absolutely stunning. If you can handle it, if you can handle the triggers in this book, I highly recommend the audiobook, just like uh, Books of Leo was saying. This is a amazing, amazing, stunning, phenomenal, phenomenal memoir. And I highly recommend it. And I am so happy that it got number three on this list. Babel. 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 Or Babel, if you're feeling fancy. Babel by R.F. Kuang. Or The Necessity of Violence, an arcane history of the Oxford Translators' Revolution. This is set in roughly the 1830s. This is a dark academia historical fiction with elements of fantasy running through it as well. About our main character Robin, who is taken from China to be raised by an English professor to study at Oxford and become one of these translation students who are part of this like institute at Oxford called Babel. Basically Babel is where the magic system comes into things in this university. So the magic system is silver working so you can write words into silver and it has various different effects. Translation is actually a core part of Britain's economy. It's about the power of language and it's an exploration of identity and belonging. The more he starts peeling back the layers of academia, seeing the problems behind it, the colonialism, the cost of the knowledge that it takes for words and language to be a resource. This is a book that deals with student revolutions and studies colonial resistance and taking over completely without respecting where these things come from. I feel like so many of the popular dark academia books are just like filled with white people and it doesn't fully like get into white privilege and systemic racism and stuff like that. But this does that. This is what I've been living through all of these years. I didn't, I just didn't know that there were words for this. This book gave me an inferiority complex and I'm okay with that. No one is going to tell me different. If you say Babel, well, ah. if you say I thought Babel was a little, ah. If you're like, Babel was trash, shut up. I don't want to hear it. Keep your opinions over there. I can't sing this book's praises enough. There were multiple times where reading the story that I physically said, I don't think that I'll ever read a better book in my life. I feel like every single person on this earth should read it. This book feels like a classic in the making and you will need to go and read it. Absolutely a masterpiece is what this book is. It is truly a masterpiece. One of the best books I've ever read. Definitely recommend it to everyone. Impeccable. Babel by Rebecca F. Kwong. She did that. Yes. Yes, God. Okay. Again, please don't unsubscribe. Please don't <laughs> click away. I... I do not think this book is bad. I do not think it's bad. I think it's incredibly intelligent. It's incredibly intelligent. I love that it exists. I love um, the topics that we discussed. I love the uh, minorities and the xenophobia and the racism and the classism and all of that that was spoken about um, and all of that in this book. It's so good, but not to me. I found it boring. I'm sorry. Um, I just found it kind of meandering and kind of boring and kind of textbooky. And I know that a lot of people enjoyed that. It just doesn't happen to be for me. So while I don't agree with it being this high on the list. I do agree with it being this high on the list for other people. And I honestly thought that this was going to be number one 
But number one, oh my god, this one, Babel, was mentioned 14 times. Book number one was mentioned 20 times. Out of 91 videos that I ended up being able to use, 20 of them had this as their best book. And I don't just mean like one of their best books. I mean, almost all 20 of these people had it in their top three books of the year. And that is book lovers, 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 book lovers by Emily Henry. We have these two characters, Nora and Charlie. Nora, who is this workaholic cutthroat literary agent. And she's sort of a shark. She's kind of the antithesis to what all of the classic rom-com women are. Just a bad bitch and she's really, really good at her job. And Charlie is a book editor. So they both work in the book, you know, industry, and I just love that. And they do not like each other. They sort of get off on the wrong foot. She's late to their first meeting. They're both in a bad mood because of things that are going on in their life, and they just really butt heads. And then after that, they just avoid each other entirely, pretty much. In this one, she takes a last trip with her sister, who's pregnant with her third child, and it's their last trip before she gives birth and they just want to spend time together. What do you know? Who happens to be there? These two co-workers find themselves in the same small town the same summer. Forced proximity. So it's like two city people that end up in this small town, which is very Stars Hollow-esque, like from Gilmore Girls. They end up working together on a project and then they're both hot people. So like, yeah. And like I said, while this is about Nora and Charlie's romance, there is also a big focus on Nora's relationship with her sister and how their relationship is growing and shifting and changing. Nora, our main character, is often seen as uptight and stern and overly organized, except they call her like a bitch and bossy and all this stuff. She's really just like an assertive, powerful woman. What's great about this book is that it's a grumpy grumpy, which I feel like is really refreshing. Grumpy sunshine is cute, but like the girl is always the sunshine and the guy is always the grumpy. And I love that Nora is a grumpy grump, just like Charlie in this book. And Charlie does not ever say to her like, oh, I love you despite these things. He loves her because of these things, which I love. Their banter, like, oh my gosh, Emily Henry writes some of my favorite banter that I've ever read. She's the queen of banter. Emily Henry is the queen of banter. Just looking at it, my heart is just full of joy. It was perfect. I have ascended to a higher plane because of this book. It's a trendsetter, it's an icon, it's a legend. Talented, brilliant, incredible, amazing, show-stopping, spectacular, never the same totally unique, completely not ever been done before, unafraid to reference or not reference, put it in a blender. Do you know what I mean? Like, exactly. Okay, I need to reread Book Lovers because I enjoyed Book Lovers, but I gave it three and a half stars because I personally did not like the relationship between the sisters. I mean, not that I didn't like the relationship. I didn't like that she called her sissy. I hate that. It's like when somebody says hubby or wifey, sissy, like I just makes my skin boil. I'm sorry. But I did really enjoy the banter and I definitely understand people giving this book five stars and loving it. Uh, I don't really understand having it be like your best book of the year, but nothing bad against the book. I love Emily Henry. I've adored basically every single thing I've ever read by her. But for me personally, it was three and a half stars. Um, but I'm not a big romance reader. So again, take it with a grain of salt. If I was a big romance reader and gave it three and a half stars, that would mean a lot. But since I don't read romance a lot and I still enjoyed it, that's pretty high praise. Thank you, thank you, thank you for watching this video. I want, if you've gotten this far, I want you to let me know if there's any of the booktubers in this video that you have found and you want to subscribe to, or that maybe you already are subscribed to and are happy to see in this video. Or if you just want to tell me that you're here to support me, then just leave the stack of books emoji because that's what this whole video is about. And that's what this whole community is about because we do need to do more in this community about being a community and helping other booktubers and promoting other booktubers because it's not all about us. It's not all about the individual. It is about forming a community and talking to each other and being there for each other. And I know it can feel like an island sometimes. Um, if you were one of the people that I'm talking about in this video, know that I watched your video. I, I did not skim through it. I watched it. And that there are so many people out there. If you're another booktuber and you made a video like this, I've seen it. I have seen it. I've watched it. And I probably didn't comment on it because again, I was watching them back to back to back to back, but I've seen it. I support you. 
I admire you. I admire you for the longevity and the difficulty and how hard it is to be to make content in this community because not only do you have to edit, but you have to read. You have to read a whole book, often multiple books in one video, and you have to review them. You have to analyze them. You have to vlog them. You have to edit it. You have to do the thumbnail. You have to do everything. And it is so much work. And to also be entertaining on top of that, like y'all are amazing. Stunning. And the people that put makeup on too, like Huh, this is only me like one day a month. So I'm astonished by you. But please, if you want to follow any of these people, do so down below. And if you are not subscribed to me, I would love if you want to do that. That would be amazing. If you want to follow me on Goodreads, Instagram, or Patreon, all of those are going to be linked down below, as well as a myriad of other links to help support this channel in many different ways. So I want to say have an amazing day, evening, night, dusk, dawn, whatever it is you're having in whatever part of the world you are currently having it in. And I will see you in a video coming very soon. Bye. You could try to play, but you're never gonna beat me. Look the other way, what I'm doing ain't easy. Bloody and stained from the people who deceive me.